This episode of Dorking Out is brought to you by Triangle Space, a website building platform that combines the outdated look of Angel Fire with the non intuitive interface of GoDaddy. Use the coupon code DORKOFF to save 6% on your first 13 hours of website hosting. Triangle Space. If building a website was easy, then you wouldn't need us. And the Truman and Jacobson's Haberdashery, located at 104 West 12th Street, the finest hats and pocket squares above 6th Street in downtown Kansas City. Houston flight is go. Myla, all of go. From Assignment X, Amalgamated Storytelling, and the Show.com, it's Dorking Out with Sonia Mansfield and Christopher Allen Smith. Welcome to Episode 54 of Dorking Out, a podcast for people who like to dork out about stories and the stories and culture that we love. That means movies and TV, books and podcasts, and everywhere else you find stories that interest you or us because it's our podcast. This is the Baby Driver Goes to Twin Peaks edition. With me today is my co-host, Emmy Award-winning filmmaker and nerd author, Christopher Allen Smith. Hello. Hi there. Hello. And with me today is my co-host, professional writer and author of The Sony Show, Sonya Mansfield. In this week's episode, we are welcoming our new podcasting friend, Mike Richman, from the political podcast... NorCal News Now, not to talk about politics, but to talk about Edgar, the new Edgar Wright movie, Baby Driver, and discuss the director's colorful, hyper-praised career. Is he the Wes Anderson of the geek movie? Then we no. welcome... No, he's not, but you know, we talk about <laughs> it a little bit. Then we welcome back Scott Daigle to talk about Twin Peaks. We are almost halfway through. Is David Lynch's return to that small Washington logging town just as opaque and random as we'd feared? Yeah, you know what? It might be. Uh, then we welcome back Mike to talk out talk about what we are dorking out about most. He's talking about Daniel Day Lewis. Sonia, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the documentary um, "Nobody Speak." The Trials of the Free Press. And I am talking about the dorkiest, nerdiest thing I have ever talked about on this show and by that's a country That's saying mile. something. That is saying a lot, but this one leaves them all in the dust. And before we move on, I want to apologize now for my voice. I have been sick all week, and I'm sorry for the coughing and the congestion but you're all gonna have to bear with me because if i didn't do this it would just be smith talking that's right how i i find it very interesting that you think that our audience is so short fused that you feel the need to apologize because you have her voice sounds janky (laughs) delete (laughs) you (laughs) bastards leave her alone Topic one, big news, you guys. A movie came out this weekend that isn't part of a franchise. It's not a sequel. It's not a superhero movie. It's not animated. It's Baby Driver, written and directed by Edgar Wright, one of the most creatively successful writers and directors in the 2000s, starting with the hilarious TV series Spaced, which also launched Simon Pegg. Edgar Wright wrote and directed Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, this one, one of my favorite recent movies, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, and The World's End. Baby Driver stars Enzel Elgort as a talented young getaway driver with a kick-ass soundtrack playing in his iPod who works for heist boss Kevin Spacey. Things get complicated when Baby falls for a waitress played by Lily James at his favorite diner, and he agrees to one last job. That's always the thing, right? Love and one last job. It gets you every time. The movie also stars John Hamm and Jamie Foxx. Joining us to talk about Baby Driver is Mike Richman from the political podcast NorCal News Now. He's here because he's a great uh, talker. Smith wrote something else here, but I'm not saying that. I'll say it. Bloviator. 
Mike, since you're a guest and Smith talks too much, I'm going to let you go first. What did you think of Baby Driver? Well, first, I've got to just say uh, this is a really honor, great honor for me. I'm I'm a huge fan uh, of the show. I, I've I think I've checked out every episode of uh, of Jerking Off with Charlie and Susan, and it's uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's an honor. I mean, it's really an honor to be I'm here really, with you, Susan. Really flattered that you are talking about my other show. What other my- show? <laughs> <laughs> you you have another show? See, that's the thing. This is this is the world we live in, people. Where Mike, I have known through business and friendship for ten years. He listens to one episode of Dorking Out, and he is Sonia Mansfield's biggest fan. It's like I don't even exist. You so, know, no, Chris, that, no. That, that's, that's everybody what... always loves me when they first meet me, and then when they get to know me, they hate me. Everybody knows this. You know, Chris, we're in the 2010s now, and it's a fast era, man. You know, you sometimes you only have one episode to fall in love with somebody or something. Uh, and, you're uh, right. Wow. It, you it, know? You're talking like somebody who's listened to the show. That's, a, that's the, a persistent theme. <laughs> 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 All right. So you want to know what I thought about Baby Driver? Yes. Is yes. that, is that the, the, the topic on the table for yes. the show? Okay. Well, you know, I I liked it. I did not love it. I liked it. Um, it was, uh, it was definitely an entertaining, you know, two hours. Um, the, the thing, and, and Chris, you can probably speak to this better than I can. The sound editing was just killer. I mean, I I just was so impressed by the, the, the rhythmic, you know, the, the beats of machine gun bullets (laughs) perfectly laid down to this track was so cool. Um, but I, you know, the story to me was okay. I mean, it was a good story. It wasn't, uh, it didn't sweep me, uh, out of my, uh, my current, um, belief system, <laughs> but it was, it was good. It was solid. It was definitely solid. I, I had a little bit of a problem with the actors, to be honest. Oh, interesting. really? How so? Well, you know, I mean, this movie was going to work if, if, you know, if John Hamm and Jamie Foxx and especially Kevin Spacey, had a lot of menace. And I didn't, I don't know, I didn't feel, I mean, I felt some menace from Jamie Foxx. Right. I felt like nothing from John Hamm. Yeah. That, I totally that disagree. Totally disagree. No, but I'm gonna I, let you, but I'm gonna let you finish. I well, agree. and and but but mostly, mostly with regard to Kevin Spacey. I mean, I've seen Kevin Spacey in movies where he just exuded that menace, you know? And it, I just he was like he was some big crime kingpin. I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, didn't go for it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, I, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. That is very I, was, I actually wrote in my notes. I think this is the best use of Kevin Spacey in a long time. Now, keep in mind, I don't watch house of cards cause it looks dumb, but finally, I think this movie has done like, has finally found something for John ham. Like I actually, I love John Hamm and I love Mad Men. I think he's amazing in Mad Men. But when it came to movies, like unless he's playing like the jerk boyfriend and bridesmaids, like he really hadn't found like the right thing. And I actually thought he was very menacing in this movie. I thought he was really good, actually. So I'm kind of surprised to hear you say that you didn't buy it. I totally bought it. I but like- I'll say like I'm I'm in for Edgar Wright movies like they work for me like they work on like every level for me all of them like I loved Spaced I loved Shaun of the Dead I love Scott Pilgrim versus the world so I love these movies and I I actually watched a little um video interview with Edgar Wright where he was talking about his editing style and like all the quick edits and things like that and how he's really big on he comes into a scene late and he leaves early. Yeah. That's, and that's how they that do it. totally works for me. And I just, I really love the story. I thought it was really fun and there was a lot of action. And I really cared about the young leads a lot. I enjoyed the music. I was, I am in love with this movie i walked out and like got the soundtrack and i'm in how many songs are on the soundtrack to baby dryer because it seems like there would be 250 songs i think there's like i think there's like 20 wow actually 
I think there are more than that. There was a lot. Of, I stuck around for the end. It seemed like it was like 30 or more. It was a lot. Yeah, that's I would, a huge amount of money. Of, I could see it, um, the movie could be like this close to being like so in love with itself. Mm-hmm. And that could be like a huge turnoff. But I felt like at a certain point, it switches and it like kind of ups the stakes and baby's no longer in the driver's seat, so right. to speak. And <laughs> I think that's when the movie kind of falls out of love with itself so that we get like something that's a little bit more uh, serious than I expected it to be. I really just thought it was so great. I'm so surprised to hear that you're just like, "Eh." Uh, no, I mean, maybe I'm being too, uh, maybe I'm being too dismissive. I mean, I like the movie very much. I just, I I think that I just felt that um, again, that from the story perspective and from the character perspective of of those three main character main baddies i actually thought that john bernthal was a more convincing baddie and i kind of wished he had come back i agree i kind of wish that they had brought him back rather than john ham yeah yeah i was i was waiting for uh john bernthal to come back the whole time and he yeah i i don't i don't get this and i you know I'm going to stick up for Mike here a little bit, even though you're not really going off on him, Sonia. I agree 100% with what Mike is saying. The editing is some of the best editing I've seen in years. The music choice and the choreography between the soundtrack and the action is insane. The stunts are really fun and enjoyable. There's so much going for this movie, but for some reason, and I can't tell you why... It's just like it's like a painting by a master uh, artist that I just am not that interested in, and I, I, I feel like I have a an Edgar Wright shaped hole in my heart, possibly where it just <laughs> it, it it goes in and it should click. Oh, with Smith, every, with, you, don't, you don't have a heart. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it should. Everything that's going on here, I should love, but I'm just not feeling it, and. I, I, I am a little jealous, and it's funny you should say something like that, because I agree with you. There is, you know, on this show, I have famously gone off on Wes Anderson and uh, Tim Burton, even though I think Wes Anderson is a lot more accomplished than Tim Burton. They're the kind of artists that are so in love with their own palette and their own style that they just kind of drive me up the wall a little bit. And Edgar Wright feels like that a little bit but he's also so intent on entertaining us and making a fun movie going experience that i kind of i still like him even though he's got those kind of director are a tour quirks because that he's not taking him all. he's not taking himself seriously exactly and that it, it this is gonna probably drive all the edgar wright fans crazy when i say this i think that's the thing that's missing from this movie it's all because, you know, one of the things that's happened in the last five years with Edgar Wright is he, you know, since the launching of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, he was supposedly working on Ant-Man. They got and everybody was very excited for Edgar Wright's Ant-Man and it chewed up a lot of his time. Famously, he left that project and then went on to Baby Driver. And I wish there was something more going on here. It's like all he, it, it was almost as though he said, You're upset all right, it's not part of a cinematic universe. No, 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 it, no. It's almost, it's almost like, yeah, we're going to get to my cinematic universe here, later in the show, <laughs> but it's almost as though he said, Oh, you're not going to let me direct this huge action Hollywood movie. Fine. I'll, I'll let me show you what I can do. And this was, um, this almost feels like an exercise in, an, an, an artist trying to make a big, loud, car chasey, gunfighty summer movie, and it's very enjoyable. But well, the, as someone who doesn't like you know, exercise, I have to yeah. say I'm very surprised then that I like this so much. <laughs> um, well, if I if I could compare this movie. <laughs> not to be too academic about it, but if I could compare this movie maybe to Citizen Kane for a moment. All right. Um, Citizen Kane technically was one was such a groundbreaking movie in so many ways. And Citizen Kane did so many things. Orson Welles was a kid when he made it, really. Um, But, you know, Citizen Kane, when you really look at it and watch the movie, 
there wasn't a lot of movie there. There wasn't a lot of story there. There wasn't a lot of acting there that really, right. see, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an acting in words and dialogue guy. And you know, Movies are a sum of experiences. Not me. I, I like to just watch a blank screen. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you, you get what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, yes. that there's that that to me, I'm very much story and acting driven. And the technical parts of it to me are kind of like the the, the, the icing on, on the cake. And this movie to me didn't have enough story that really wrapped me into it, I guess, is my my bottom line. Let, let me ask you this. Mike, and I think this might be part of it for me and Sonia. Uh, on the show, we the, we go back to a, a measuring system for actors, uh, the Freddie Prince Jr. <laughs> scale. Based, well, based, okay, okay. Based on the not late and not great Freddie Prince Jr., which is an actor that neither attracts you nor repels you. They're on the screen, they're in the movie, but they just, they're like a dead space. They're just like absolute, they're inert on the screen. I think for me, Ansel Elgort was v- a very boring central character to pay attention to. I, I get the, it, it was, it was almost as though Edgar Wright said, all right, what's, you know, what's he good at? Oh, he's good at driving. He's got a funny name and he listens to music. So that's what I can cut to in all the action. Uh, and then, well, you know, his parents did this and that and, you know, a little bit of backstory. But, all right, we got that. And then he went on. It, it was almost like this was like a technical feat of acrobatics by the filmmakers. So if this movie than... had starred like a Ryan Gosling or something, you think you would maybe, have connected with it a little bit maybe. more? Maybe. I just I just yeah, was completely definitely. I was completely not bought in to Enzo Elgort. He was just very bland. Um and, and now that we're talking about this, every other actor on screen, including, you know, uh, Lily James, who plays his love interest, and, you know, Kevin Spacey was more interesting to watch, Lily James more interesting to watch, Eliza Gonzalez more interesting uh, to watch, John Han, you know, every, I will you say, know, everybody. He does remind me a little bit of um, Ryan Phillippe. Yeah, from the nineties. Yeah, and and he's another one that I was like, perfectly fine actor, um, but didn't really do it for me. Yeah, like you know, I so I guess I kind of understand what you're saying. It still worked for me. Yeah, but I think I understand. Like maybe if they had put someone with like just a little bit more, like charisma, I guess. Something. Yeah, and maybe that's the thing. Is you know, like. One of the things that, you know, like in the whole Robin Hood mythos, little John, Robin Hood's friend, is gigantic. That's kind of the whole thing is he's got this small diminutive name, but he's this huge hulking presence. And Ansel Elgort, it would have been interesting to have the central character be like called baby, but he's huge and big and or... He's yeah, he's what got the movies about though. Well, that's that's the thing is he it, there would be some counterpoint to the name that would make it funny or interesting or whatever. But instead, it's like yeah, he's a little he's a little baby kid and he's a little baby kid and his name's Baby. And well, I you know, I think that's fine. I think it was a way of Kevin Spacey's character kind of keeping him in his place. Yeah, yeah, because you know it's not his real name. That's true. No, that's true. And I think I I, I kind of agree with. Uh, Mike I the- re- I really like this movie. I I actually I'm surprised to hear you guys say how that you know you didn't think there was much for story or character. Or, uh, you know when I, 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 I really do think that it had all those things. It for me. It yeah. Did. Part part of it too is expectations going in. I mean I I had I had some expectations of this going in that were very high. It was a a 97 Rotten Tomatoes score, which you know yeah. isn't always doesn't always mean anything, but. It, many times it does, and and I was going into it with that that in mind, and I guess it may have just been, it, it didn't reach the level of oh my gosh, you know, that I was maybe anticipating. You know, I think that's right, and that is one thing I meant to say before we came on. Thank you for reminding me, Mike. I think Edgar Wright has a hype problem. The people that love him so much, they they lo- they don't just love him a little; they love him a lot. Like he is their f- nearly favorite filmmaker of a pretty big contingent of you know opinion makers on the web so when his movies come out and i think scott pilgrim 
suffered from this a little bit because you know it got previewed at a comic con it was supposed to be the next huge thing and then it came and people loved it but it was kind of a box office you know fizzle out yeah it didn't really set the world on fire exactly it didn't really set the world on fire i love that movie i i hear you i it is so so yeah. funny. Like I, every time I watch it, it gets funnier and funnier. I'm sure I it can't does. believe that people aren't like talking about it now more. Yeah. And I, I just love it. Yeah, I'm sure it does. And that's the thing is I think I think his movies <laughs> get hyped just a little too much. So in a weird way, and I and I found myself with this, like if if I had no idea what Baby Driver was about. If I didn't know who the the director was and I just walked in, I'm pretty sure I would have been blown away. But because I had heard like, oh, my God, this is Edgar Wright. He's so insanely talented. He's so insanely funny. This movie has 97 percent. It's like he's his movies get hyped up too much. So by the time uh, they come out, even a Herculean effort of artistry can't quite clear the bar of the expectations that have been sent. Mm-hmm. And none of that is fair to him. None of that should play a factor in how we watch his movies. But unfortunately, we have to watch movies with the perceptions that we have when we walk in. And for me, I think that's just it. I mean, this is a really this is a really good movie. This is very in- enjoyable. But, you know, it is not flipping all my switches that I would expect to have flipped from an accomplishment like this, I guess, is my bottom line. And Sonia, I, I should say, I should jump in here and say that you have to bear in mind when I, I give you this review that my favorite filmmaker actually is Charlie Kaufman. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a slightly different milieu than uh, than we're dealing with here. But uh, so, you know, I mean, that's that's kind of where I'm, I'm coming from on some of these right. movies. So bear, right. bear that in mind. So, Sonia. Yes. Now is the time. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to say? Uh, no, I'm ready to go. Let's, Not, let's right. do this. Now is the time to answer the question that you always hate to answer. I hate, yes. Uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, what would you mm-hmm. give Baby baby Driver? A 9. All right. Mike, what would you give Baby Driver? I, I probably would give it like a 7.5. Holy smokes. Mike takes my score exactly <laughs> down to the half. Oh, we congratulations, didn't talk about this. Mike. That means you're the new co-host of Dorky Now. <laughs> it's we your problem now, sucker. <laughs> yeah. Well, goodbye, everybody. Bye. <laughs> I had a good Mike run. Dog. Hey, want more Dorking Out? Yep. You can visit our website at dorkingoutshow.com. You can. And you can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. On Twitter. Do you listen to us on iTunes? Yep. It's cool. It's cool. We won't tell anyone. Nope. Please take a few minutes out of your busy day of pretending to work while you watch cat videos to give us a review on iTunes. Cat videos! For some reason, iTunes really cares about reviews and it helps us attract more listeners and you want us to have more listeners and be popular and cool, don't you? Yep. Of course you do. Yeah. And now, on with the show. Yeah. That brings us to topic two, our revisiting of Twin Peaks at nearly the halfway point. This is the Twin Peaks review. Eight episodes down, ten to go topic. Not addition, because we're having other things on the show. But, let me begin by saying, in the age of reboots, revivals, and reimagining misfires, when David Lynch returned to television with 18 new episodes of his groundbreaking Twin Peaks show on May 21st, We were hopeful, but also suspicious. Was this going to be an X-Files style return where the thing comes back, but it is somehow some living dead corpse of what it used to be? It shouldn't have come back. Or was this going to be like Star Trek where the the new episodes on the new show become a thing of their own and are beautiful like a Star Trek versus Star Trek The Next Generation? And both are great. Well... We promised to return with our thoughts halfway through the season and for various scheduling and impatience reasons. (laughs) We've watched eight (laughs) episodes. Uh, We got ten to go, but we're going to have the discussion now. So we thought that we would bring on our David Lynch-loving 
cohort. Scott Daigle, renowned videographer, one-time Lucasfilm mailroom maven, to talk about Twin Peaks. Has it revolu revolutionized television again? Does television need revolutionizing? Or is this just the latest in a lot of revival misfires? Scott Daigle. Yes, what, sir. What do you think of Twin Peaks on Showtime now that you've seen eight episodes? I am in love with it. And I mean that wholeheartedly. I adore this. I'm not even sure it's a reboot. I would dare say it is just a continuation. It's a revival. Uh, it, well, you know, yeah, revival, continuation, it pays. I would say it's a continuation. Set. I think that's accurate. It, it picks right up uh, 25 years later and just goes. Let's see, here we go. You're either on board or you're not. And I have been loving every single episode. I've been watching it with this giant, goofy grin on my face. Uh, just on many levels. I'm enjoying it just because this is something that I've really been looking forward to. And I've also just simultaneously been wondering what are people who have heard about the hype but have never watched Twin Peaks experiencing right at this moment while they're watching the show? Because it's crazy. It is, uh, I believe you said it is 100% uncut, unfiltered David Lynch. Uh, and he has returned with this giant roar uh, and said, everything that you think you know about me, forget it. We are going in directions you never could have imagined, and I couldn't be happier to be along for the ride. Sonia Mansfield, what are yes. your thoughts? I think I might like my David Lynch a little filtered, <laughs> <laughs> is what I've discovered. I'm going to say, like, I 100% appreciate, like, what's happening on the show on the new mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. Like, I think it's uh, super weird, uh, but emotional. It, it, I, 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 but I, I kind of miss the Twin Peaks that was on ABC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe I, I think maybe I want him just a little bit restricted. You know, I liked his twisted take on like typical TV fare. And this is so off the chain, super weird. He can do whatever he wants. And that's interesting. And I'm watching it and I'm super interested. I'm going to watch the whole thing. But I do miss those characters. And I miss like a story that's kind of connecting everything that I'm seeing. Um, sure. You know, I do think a lot of this Twin Peaks is filled with a lot of really strange but striking imagery and feelings and stories that are like kind of like very, very loosely connected. Um, but like, it's just not all like coming together. And I keep thinking like, maybe I'm going to be rewarded, you know, and it is all going to come together at the end, but I don't think so. Cause I just don't think David Lynch gives an F what I think, you know, <laughs> I don't think he cares. Um, I have such a strange reaction to this show because like I said, like I, I miss Dale Cooper. Like I want Cooper back. I don't want this like Dougie version. Like I want Dale Cooper back, but I understand that they have to maybe go this way to get there. I don't know, but there's stuff in these random asides that he's doing that emotionally affect me that, I'm like, I'm so glad I watched that. So then I'm like, I feel conflicted. I don't know if I'm making any sense. Am I making any sense? No, it you're sounds making, to me you're making a like you're enjoying sense. it. Yeah. Like, like I'm enjoying it's, it. It's at least I'm rad. enjoying it, but it's not what I wanted it to be. But that doesn't mean uh -huh. I'm not enjoying it. Like sure. there was something, I'm not going to spoil things for people, but there was something yeah, in I, episode I know, seven. I don't know if you could. <laughs> I don't know if you can spoil things for people. Let me you just could say, in episode seven, yeah, a little boy gets hit by a car. Oh, that's right. I was watching that on an airplane, and I <laughs> cried and cried and cried, like sobbing on oh, the plane. Mm -hmm. It was like 10 a.m., 
I ordered a drink. I ordered a drink. I was like, drink now, but press the button. Bring me a glass of wine, please. <laughs> it is like, it was like watching my nightmare. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. I'm not laughing at the kid getting hit by a truck. I, no, and no, laugh I am no, laughing at, at the thought of you being in this completely domestic, regular situation and having to live through That's some David realized. Lynch freak out. Yeah. This is not plain appropriate show for me. <laughs> like, because I'm in this confined space and stuck here with these people <laughs> who have to listen to me. Like Ooh. cry and cry Ooh. and like sob and like, you know, and I'm like, maybe it's one, oh, like just a total wreck, you know, because it, and it, but it's, and these are like minor characters that we don't really get any story for them at all, but it just yeah. affected me on like such a level. And then there's stuff in last week's episode, episode eight, that's <laughs> absolutely terrifying to me. Like, the visuals are like so scary and disturbing that I'm like, they're going to stick with me. So oh, it's just such a strange show. But I mean, I'm like I said, I'm glad I'm watching it. Yeah. I am with you, Sonia. I, I, I think I do want my David Lynch cut in some fashion. Um, and I want I want to throw a metaphor for what's going on with this and why I'm not reacting to this the same way I had hoped. And I just want to see what you guys think. So, like in the 1800s, the art world was very constricted. You did portraits, you did landscapes, you tried to be make things look like they looked in the real world. Then the impressionists started doing their things. Then the cubists started doing their things, and the abstract and art became modern art and it became more less connected to the realness of the world around us to just all kind of weird abstract stuff so now we're at the point where pretty much every barrier in art has been broken to the point at which you can take a urinal stick it on a wall put your artist's <laughs> name on it and say i am doing some comment meta commentary on blah 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 and here is my piece of art a urinal that came out of some factory, but I have somehow turned it into art because I touched it or something. Wait, are you saying Twin Peaks is a urinal? No, what I'm saying is <laughs> since the original Twin Peaks came on, television was insanely constrained. You had hour-long dramas, half-hour-long sitcoms, news and documentaries, and things were very rigid, very regimented, very confined. Almost to the point where you couldn't even tell connecting stories from one episode to the next. And Twin Peaks came along, connected all their episodes in an HBO style way, had insane imagery, wildly funny, weird, incredibly dark, creepy. It just like broke every, you know, it began the modern television era in a sense. But now we're at a point where you can do anything you want, you know, in the era of Netflix and Hulu and all this stuff. You, creators can make anything they want. They can go in any direction they want. They can get as wild as they want. So it's, it's, it's almost like uh, David Lynch is trying very hard to aggressively kind of shake things up in television but I don't know that it needs shaking up because, you know, television creators can already do anything that they want at this point. So, which leads <coughs> us to, okay, this is David Lynch telling a story and that's just, that's all that it is. It's not the second coming of the revival or, you know, the renewal of television. And it's interesting and it's fun, but... It's pretty cold. It's pretty... A lot of the things that were there in Twin Peaks, like the humor... I mean, for me, David Lynch at his best was kind of like three things. There's the weird... There's the... There's the engaging small town life, like the smallness of life, the small town America, or the Americana that he's interested in. Then there's... 
the creepy, dark, deep underside of that America. Then there's the bizarre, weird, abstract nightmares that he puts on film. And when you put those three things together in roughly that proportion, it is very interesting, very magical. It's enough to have stories that we like and characters that we engage in, but then we get to go off in these weird different areas and different directions that is an experience unlike any other TV show that's ever been out there. For me, this Twin Peaks is 100% crazy. 100% <laughs> David Lynch asking in every millisecond of every scene, how can I make this weird and strange? And because of that, like none of the characters seem like real people. None of the characters seem like people that we know, which is fine, but it's it's almost like... But it's weird because it's based off a TV show where we, we were supposed to relate. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know. Uh, and every once in a while it goes back to these characters. Yes, exactly. Almost, almost as fan service. That's the us. thing is I don't even know if it really is fan service. It's, 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 it's you know, like, for example, like, you know, like why, you know, why do they go back to the diner at all? I don't know. Well, what does it have to do with anything? Exactly. Like, Let's talk about Dale Cooper, one of the, my favorite characters of all time television, <clears throat> has still not really shown up on this show. He's this kind of lobotomized character, Dougie, that is so. I don't want to say dumb, but he's so, you know, strange and weird and. Not what he was, but there are moments where you can kind of see the Dale Cooper that we know in there. But we've we're halfway through the show, and it's kind of like we're never we're never going to get Dale back. I'm I'm beginning to think, right? Um, and which is fine, and it's it it is interesting for a creator to take something that people have loved for years and say I'm going to go in a new direction with this. This is a little bit like. Stay with me. George Lucas making his prequels, which is I am taking this thing that people love and know in a certain way, and I'm going to try to go over the same ground, but I'm going to try to break new ground and do different things with this same well, yeah. franchise. Yeah, um, no, this is, I thought the uh, same thing, actually, mm. especially after this most recent episode, which I think is so bizarre and random and it doesn't seem to all tie together. And I was like, we're basically seeing like what, I mean, this is how I took it. I don't know. Yeah. The origin story of Bob. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, and that was another one where I was like, well, I don't know if I really needed that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was like, this is kind of like an alien covenant situation or even a Darth Vader situation. I don't know if I needed to know where Bob came from because they told us on the show that like Bob was kind of like a manifestation of like the evil that men do. Right. And that's good enough for me. Yeah. I don't, I don't need a whole episode with like the atomic bomb <laughs> like stuff, which is totally crazy sequence to look at. And it, wow. that, that was really, I mean, really amazing the way it's shot. Yeah, I, I, one thing I do want to say, just real quick, is that sequence, that episode on its own, if it were not Twin Peaks or whatever, and it was just, here is a 55-minute film by David Lynch, it would be insane. It would be really creepy, really engaging, really Definitely amazing. Definitely creepy. And there, there are Derry. moments in it. Yeah, Derry, yeah. There are moments in it. That I thought, like, wow, it, 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 you could almost say, like, oh, David Lynch is trying to do his end of 2001 thing, and actually, he's doing a pretty good job. He is getting very abstract and very weird with a serious vision, and he is really going for it, and it's galvanizing to watch, but it's, uh, you know, part of me is just wondering, why, why did he put, why is the name Twin Peaks on here? Because it's not it seems to be not really connected in any real way at all i i'd, I'd be shocked if more than 10 percent of the screen time we've seen on this show has to do with twin peaks 
But, Scott, you've been quiet for quite a bit. I've rambled for a while. I've just been listening. I've Tell just me been what listening. you think. Uh, I can't believe we're all watching the same show. <laughs> uh, and Well, that's the beauty of David Lynch, right? It really like is the beauty of David Lynch. And I think, to your point, uh, Smith, that do you prefer Smith or Chris? Which would you rather I prefer, you address? He, oh, he I, prefers Chris. Yeah, I prefer Chris. And Sonia, right, Chris. that's why Sonia calls me Smith, because that's the kind of person she is. All right, very good. So, it's true. To your point, Chris. Yes. Uh, we have reached a point where you can do anything on television. And when Twin Peaks first came on, it as you guys have very correctly stated it really changed the game and the ripples are still being uh felt today in the tapestry that we see as modern television and i think that he has once again really stirred the pot but in the best possible way i think that yes we can do anything we want now but it's all very focus group pre-programmed a leads to b leads to c it's all epic we can do things with special effects now that will take us, uh, you know, television now, now rivals uh, cinema in so many ways. And, but it's all very straightforward narrative storytelling, which is fine. And I enjoy it a lot. Most people do. But there's something about Lynch taking a really sharp left turn taking us out on a journey, and that's really what it is. Twin Peaks has always been more about the journey than the destination, and that frustrates a lot of people, and I understand that. And I in absolutely no way wish to come across as someone saying, oh, look, I get something you don't, because I don't always get it. It's, it's what he's done here with these eight episodes has expanded – what television can be again here in the new century with this show, it's important to us, I think, that we're shown images that don't always go together, that don't always spell it out for us. We have to make up our own minds about what's happening. The creative side of my soul needs this. I I'll, I'll say that this maybe the sh the scenes don't, spell it out for us but they do make you feel something and it could be yes. that that's what he's trying to get you to do right and i think this last episode absolutely blew the doors off of what an episode of television can be in this day and age to suddenly shift gears the way that he did without trying to give too many spoilers to those people who are out there that have not seen this to take the first 10 minutes of the episode and devote it to whatever sort of narrative they're loosely trying to hold together and then take a giant left turn and go full, I, I don't even know, you know, 1950s sci-fi horror. It's, it was amazing. And I sat watching it in the dark with my jaw on the ground. Just, I, I loved it. I couldn't. I think I it's not. just so it's such a strange show and really we could I could talk about the whole the show for like the entire podcast the because isn't that it, awesome it's isn't one of these amazing? things where I was like can I recommend Twin Peaks to someone and it's like I don't know if I can because it's almost like a personal thing it's like yes you you get Look. what you want like you get from it what you put into it or so I don't yeah yeah it's really weird, like the parts that like connect to me and the parts that I'm like, uh, eh, you know, that doesn't work for me or, you know, I don't know if I'm comfortable like recommending the show to someone else because I don't know what their interpretation would be. Then they'd be like, why did Sonia recommend this to me? Uh, yeah. It's not weird for when I'm on it's a podcast and. Yeah, it's it's for, you know, it's, it, it's for grownups. I, you know, it's funny. I. I am coming around or I shouldn't say coming around because I, I did kind of agree with Scott in that this is a very interesting, very engaging. This is not uh, I'm going to probably irritate a couple people saying it this way. This is not some arty farty college art class exercise that's no. fun, fun for the artist, but not fun for anyone watching or anyone experiencing. This is 
genuinely engaging, genuinely different. And that's the thing is, is, you know, I'm not a huge fan of, you know, a lot of performance art or a lot of abstract filmmaking just because it's kind of like, okay, yeah, that's great. But (laughs) it kind of leaves me a little bit cold. This is not that this is very abstract and crazy and nutty, but it is having a, an impact. I'm just not sure how, uh, I, I, I think I am chafing against the expectation that this has something to do with the Twin Peaks that I knew, and it feels like it doesn't really. It almost feels a little bit like David Lynch said, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm not really making movies anymore. The movie-making landscape's changing. Hey, I got this Twin Peaks thing in my back pocket. I'm going to go to Showtime. I'm going to give them to write me a big check. <laughs> <laughs> so I can make this crazy movie. I'll just slap the well, name Twin Peaks on it, and then I'll do whatever well, the hell wait. I want. That's slightly unfair. It is. You, yes, it is. It's slight, slightly. But look, first but, of all, it makes me laugh that somewhere out there, there's an ABC exec who is screaming with laughter at the moment. That's right. Slapping his knee, calling some executive at Showtime, screaming, I told you, I told you not to give that guy creative control. Yeah. But it's... <sighs> Lynch is kind of a – look, first of all, what I really want to say is that Mark Frost is an equal partner in all of this. Uh, and I think that given the history of those two uh, and the projects that they put together, I think that both of them have a deep love of this source material. I think that they're both really committed to it and they're taking it in directions that we didn't anticipate. And that causes anxiety and worry in longtime viewers. I 100% believe that by the end of this show, you are going to see some form of Dale Cooper close to what you're expecting. It might not be exactly it, but it's about the journey, not the destination. And it's the teasing it all out slowly, making it all happen, you know, in their own way, in their own time, taking the road they want to take. And for me, I'm in the passenger seat of this thing, just with this giant grin. I can't wait for the next episode. I can't wait to see where this thing takes me. This version of Twin Peaks, I had all the anxiety when they they announced it and I didn't know, oh, they're gonna mess it up and it's gonna be terrible. I, my own self, could not possibly be happier with what I'm seeing. And I applaud the courage and the nerve that Showtime showed by writing a giant check and giving it to this guy and saying, <laughs> you have full creative control, go make something that's going to appeal to a very niche crowd. Uh, this is a giant risk on Showtime's yeah. part, and I, I applaud them. I really hope he's not getting anyone fired. I suspect he might be, <laughs> but I am, uh, but might, I am glad he he's doing it. What do you guys think about the, like, Every episode has this like random band playing at the roadhouse or whatever. <laughs> Isn't it weird? No. It's totally like, guess who got caught in Boss Hog's speed trap this week, you guys? <laughs> it's Nine Inch Nails. It's, it's Nine Inch Nails. Like, yeah. it's a you know, I'm like, it's super random, right? Yeah, but well, it's almost like a nice, bad. but it's almost like a. Uh, I want to say palate cleanser. It's yeah. like, it, Maybe, you know, yeah. a nice way to kind of end the episode. Sure. Like, us out with some music. Sure. <laughs> play us out, Nine Inch Nails. Right. Or we'll play, or or we'll have the episode end with just, uh, here's a snapshot of uh, 10 minutes at the diner with what's happening in the background. It's just, right. this is what it looks like when the diner's operating. Oh, that's right. And I love it. I, I it's, it's, television that i find very engaging because i don't know what's coming next i have no idea what is around the corner i can't even begin to uh to construct it in my head about what's and with most shows as much as i love them you sort of know where this is all going a you know a leads to b leads to c and and this has me completely off guard and so few shows do that for me that i'm I'm loving it. I'm yeah. I'm absolutely loving this. I we could agree. come back at episode after the last, you know, by after episode 18, I could be here absolutely crying in my beer and saying how much 
I was let down and it just wasn't worth it. But right now, 100% in. Totally bought in. All right. By the yeah. way, we'll be back for ep- after episode yeah, 18 we, and we'll talk about it. Yeah, we are definitely going to do it because I, I got to tell you, I agree. <laughs> I agree with everything you said and I agree with everything that I said. Um, so, <laughs> of course you do. I, so, yeah, no, I'm with you. And the, those two things might sound very contradictory, but I don't think they are. I think. Uh, I, I, th- I think that is a very interesting way. It's we've seen almost half of it. The jury's still out. Uh, hey, but isn't it interesting <laughs> that that look at the kind of yeah. feelings, opinions yes. that this thing is generating? That's awesome. Yeah, we could be we could still be in the midst of a train wreck. But yes, we could. Holy smokes, yes, we could. This is a very interesting ride. It is. It is. And I and I and I welcome. I absolutely welcome it. And that brings us to what we're dorking out about this week. Um, I'm going to go first. I want to go first. Hit it. So I I want to mention a documentary that I watched on Netflix the other day called Nobody Speak, The Trials of the Free Press. Have either of you guys watched this? I haven't. My wife, Laura, has watched it. She says it's great. I've heard podcasts on it. I'm very interested, but I just haven't gotten to it yet. It is... Uh, about like the privacy rights kind of against the First Amendment. And it starts as a documentary about the case against Gawker from uh, Hulk Hogan. Right. And you think that's all it's going to be about. But and 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 this is very interesting, the idea that basically it's probably one of the biggest cases for the First Amendment. But everyone just thinks it's like this really gross case about like Hulk Hogan's sex tape. But it's way more than that it's really it's... important and it kind of reminds me of the people versus larry flint oh wow the idea of the first amendment will protect like a scumbag like that it'll protect all of you like the importance of the first amendment so there's that part but there's also a part about like kind of conservative millionaires like buying communication companies like or buying newspapers. So in particular, a rich casino owner buying the Las Vegas Review Journal. Oh, that's right. I forgot about and that. And kind of his, you know, he starts to kind of inflict his views on that. And as someone who's worked for newspapers and has had this happen, like it's, it, it is one of those things that's like threatening free press that you that a lot of people don't talk about. So I thought it was really interesting. And then you just kind of have like even like the stuff that happened this past weekend with President Trump and tweeting out about CNN and, you know, all these things and calling people fake news and all that. And just this like really like kind of sinister trend that's like threatening the free press. And I think the documentary is very timely and I think it's very interesting. It doesn't necessarily tie everything together the way maybe it needs to, but I liked what it was trying to say. So correct, or let's possibly remind all of our listeners, you used to, you used to work at the San Francisco Examiner. Is that, that right? That is correct. And what, who, is, who, who bought the Examiner at the time, or which used to be a Hearst paper? It's famously one of the Hearst, uh, William Randolph Hearst papers back in right. the early well, part of the I actually century. started, I started working for the Examiner after it was bought by a really um, wealthy Chinese family called the Fangs. Mm-hmm. And it was, it got very political and they had a lot of political um, intentions mm. with their or, you know, you you will publish this story. You won't publish that story. Mm. You know that sort of thing. Um, it was later bought by. Um, sorry, the I don't remember the name of the company, but um, it was the McKibben brothers, mm-hmm. and they actually like had like film studios and things like that. So then there was kind of this like you'll give our movies a good review. Oh. You know, wow. like stuff like Holy that. Holy smokes. And, you know, stuff you kind of start to get really uncomfortable. That seems you know? like a and lot then, of work for a good Rotten Tomatoes score. Right. You know, and even then, like, you know, you're like, is this the hill I die on? Is this like, you know, it's like, yeah. do I have to give a good review to a movie like Ray, which is a perfectly fine movie anyway. But right. any, you know, that sort of thing. So this sort of thing kind of speaks to me and it's in my wheelhouse, if you will. I hate using that 
I'm sorry I even said that. Um, but that's the Theraflu talking. All right. It's a really, really good documentary. Like I said, I don't think it ties all the ideas together as well as it should. But what it's saying is really important, especially right now. Cool. I will definitely give that a watch. Me too. So, Mike Mann, let's go on to you next. Because I think mine might be a little too boring to... I, I want to get to yours first before I kill the show with mine. So you, you, you will be the capper. <laughs> That's right. I'll be the capper, the boring, All boring right. capper that will stop everyone from listening. But anyway, as, as usual, a, with a with a lead in like that, let's talk about <laughs> Mike's. <laughs> well, what I am guest dorking out about this week is the retirement of the great Daniel Day Lewis, the uh, the actor, one of the greatest actors ever, I, I would say, and certainly of our generation. Um, you know, I, I have to say I have not watched every Daniel Day Lewis movie, but I've, I've seen many, if not most of them. Um, to me, he's kind of the, uh, acting equivalent of like a Stanley Kubrick, you know, didn't, not the most prolific oh, yeah. uh, guy in the world, but the quality, the individual quality and the, and the, the, the stamp, the brand that he brought to his, his work was just so indelible. I mean, of course his, his thing is, is the, the, the voice, um, the mannerisms, the method, um, you know, and he's, to me, he's the right kind of method actor. You know, I mean, there, there, there's several method actor types, archetypes over, over the time that method, the method has been a thing from like, you know, Marlon Brando to, you know, idiots like Shia LaBeouf and, you know, and, uh, who else? River Phoenix, and uh, who's that other asshole? Uh, Casey Affleck, you know. I mean, <laughs> these 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 method who's actors. Who's that other son of a? What's his name? Yeah, you know, I, Casey Affleck. Yeah, that guy. Uh, I mean, you know, Manchester by the Sea was a great movie, but he's still a schmuck. Anyway, um, the point being that you know, Daniel Day Lewis is a method actor in the right way. You know, he 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 really inhibits these guys. I mean, I'm a history guy, Chris. You know this. We we've talked a lot about history and my affinity for for history. I mean, what Daniel Day Lewis did with Lincoln was just. I mean, just incredible. I mean, I watched that movie. I've watched it now two or three times. Yeah. And I would encourage anybody listening to this uh, to to watch uh, the now scene from Lincoln. It's on YouTube. Just type in Lincoln now in YouTube. Yeah. Uh, it's like a two minute scene. I don't know if you guys uh, both can can recollect it easily, but oh, definitely. I mean, it's it's unbelievable what he what he did in that scene. I mean, you know, he he was Lincoln. I mean, you 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 watch this. And from the voice to the mannerisms to the the humanity, the humor, uh, the kind of Machiavellian, um, you know, guy who would do what it took to get what he wants, he was Lincoln. I mean, and same thing in There Will Be Blood, same thing in Gangs of New York. I mean, he inhibited, inhabited every character that he took on. And, you know, and there'll never be another one like Daniel Day-Lewis. And I, I, I kind of miss him already. I hope he's not really retired. I, I, I know this, this, this latest movie uh, supposedly is his last one. The what's it called? The, uh, the Ghost Thread, the Phantom Thread. I think so. Yeah, it's Paul Thomas Anderson's latest yeah. movie. I, I think, think he thing. just doesn't want to do superhero movies, which I totally <laughs> get. I yeah. think, yeah. Well, well but I mean. I, I just I, I I mean I hope it's not his last movie uh, uh, because uh, you know I'll miss him I'll miss the I'll miss his 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 work going forward. Oh, definitely. I I I, I am a hundred percent with you, and it's I it was pretty heartbreaking for me to hear this because I was for some reason kind of getting into a Daniel Day Lewis kick about a week and a half back, and I was I went to a party and a friend of mine who we kind of for several years we've talked about. Lincoln, and it's like I like it. He he's a huge fan of Lincoln. I like Daniel Day Lewis's performance in it, but as a movie, I wasn't too sure about it. So I said, you know what? Came home from the party. I'm gonna watch this. I watched about half of it. It's like wow, it it is quite insane how good he is in this. I've and, actually I, I've never seen it. You well, you really should because here's the thing about that movie and his performance and the the worthiness of the method acting when it's done well is we have a lot of writing on Lincoln, the kind of person that he was, people describing his mannerisms, his voice, his this and that. But in history, uh, documentaries and books and stuff, he, he's become so shrouded in the great man kind of mythos that it's kind of difficult to see him as a person. 
Um, and, you know, all of the people that they have read Lincoln speeches all have deep, sonorous voices, and it's very nice to listen to, but it's not at all what his real voice supposedly was like. Um, it was supposedly kind of high, kind of nasally. I don't, I don't want to say irritating, but it's it's not the deep. Oh, my God. His voice sounded like me right now, huh? <laughs> well, a little bit, because here's the thing. And Daniel Day Four Lewis. Four score is, and seven years ago. A little bit. Uh, yeah, kind of, yeah. <laughs> That's not too yeah, far off. Yeah. Daniel Day Lewis's performance with his this weird, strange, high voice. Or what people when the first when the movie came out they were like what the hell is he doing with his voice it's like no that's that's Lincoln I'm sure Daniel Day Lewis has researched this you know to death this is Lincoln and his performance is like a real is like what it's like to see somebody that is a great person but also you know puts his pants on you know one leg at a time he really in the interaction with his son you can see that he wants to be a good father but he's kind of desperate. And fathers lose their temper, and you see him do that, and it's. But then you also see what it, others see in him is genuinely great, and it is just, it's one of the best performances I've ever seen. And I, I think it was within an hour of me finishing Lincoln the day after I started it that this news came out, and I was just, I was quite upset. It's you know, it was. Depressing. uh if, if you read the source material uh, from the movie, uh, A Team of Rivals by Doris Kearns Goodwin, which was a fantastic book. Yeah. Um, you know, when I heard that that was going to be the the source material for Lincoln, I was kind of like scratching my head like, well, how the heck are they going to make that work? Because so much of it was, you know, showing Lincoln not in a really that much of a favorable light. I mean, it very much showed him being a, a very deal driven, transactional guy, not a guy who was saying that, you know, slavery is this horrible thing, but more of, well, you know, we've got to do what we got to do. And yeah. very much a realist. And I was saying, well, it's not the Lincoln that most people think of or know or think they know. But he, Daniel Day-Lewis and Steven Spielberg, um, you know, did a, such a magnificent job of teasing out the three dimensions of that person. Um, ah, it's just, yeah. Uh, Sonia, yeah, definitely watch it. I think you... I think yeah. you really appreciate it from that perspective. Yeah. I just can't see him walking away if like a really juicy role came his way. Like I, something that was like really a challenge I, that he would just have to say yes. I agree with you. The problem, I'm looking at his filmography on the Internet Movie Database now as we're talking about this. The problem is I think we're getting to the level where I don't know if a script that's worthy of him can be written. I know that's kind of a ridiculous thing to say, but if you think about him going from Bill the Butcher well, no, that's, to that's Daniel part Plainview. Of the problem. Yeah. He doesn't want to do like, yeah. of course he probably doesn't want to do like, I don't want to be in the Iron Man reboot or, you know, I don't want to be in the next Star Wars movie or I'm not yeah. interested in being in the DC movie. Like, Has we're he... making so many of these movies now that, you know, yeah. No wonder. I would imagine he might be frustrated. I'm, I'm sure he probably is. I, I'm I'm almost wondering if they could find a show or some something for him. Because I mean, for, I mean, the, a guy that can go from Bill the Butcher <laughs> to Daniel Plainview to Lincoln, and all I mean, those widely varied characters, and be as good as he is. I mean, Lincoln is an example. I think of the scripts pretty good the story is pretty good but his performance you know if the script is a seven his performance is a 20 he well, is, i don't i don't i i think we're also getting to the point where i don't know how many actors can really stand with him on screen without getting you know crushed he is one of those people who's always super awesome obviously yeah. but um what i remember was we had I worked at a movie theater and our movie theater showed Last of the Mohicans. Did you guys see that movie? <laughs> I did. It's it's I did, kind yeah. of a it's kind of a soapy not a super awesome movie, but it is insanely rewatchable and he's actually so good in it that you find your like there were people who came back to see that movie like 3, 4, 5, 6 times. Well, it was still play I was like, you're here again seeing this movie. He's because he's just so good and like everything, even something 
I don't know. It was so weird, that movie. It wasn't, it was just so soapy and yeah. I can't think of a better word than that. No, but And right. we also showed The Crucible and he's right. amazing in it. Mm-hmm. Like, just like on yeah. a whole other level than every, yeah. like, and everyone in that movie is really, really great. Yeah. But he is bananas in that movie he's just one of those actors who's just bananas you're i mean maybe it is maybe you're right maybe there's just he's too good for us (laughs) (laughs) might be maybe maybe might be all right so we're gonna jump on then to what i am dorking out about and maybe this is incredibly boring but maybe not a few months ago yeah yeah i know sonya's gonna think this is boring so a few months ago, I was trying to get everybody to read War and Peace. I was all How'd that go? It. it didn't go that well. Uh, I tried it. I couldn't get into it as an audio experience. <laughs> I am. I'm not dead yet. I'm still gonna come. Gonna come back to it. <laughs> now, as is want, I am trying something twenty times dorkier now. So I have been a. Uh, member of audible it's audiobook this fantastic audiobook uh service that i'm sure if you're listening to this episode of dorking out this deeply you know what audible is anyway i've been a, i've been a member for audible for like the last 10 years 15 years um and i also listen to a lot of npr and there's a lot of presidential biographies and historians that are on there so i've found in myself that a lot of times what I'll do is somebody will like write a new biography of Nixon. It's like, oh, that sounds great. I should listen to that. I'll go buy it and then I won't listen to it. I'll just go on. I'll listen to podcasts or something. And then I realized like a week and a half ago, I probably have biographies of nearly every president in my Audible account. And then I was thinking, you know what would be interesting is to listen to those <laughs> in sequence. Starting with uh, Washington, then John Adams, Jefferson, uh, Andrew Jackson, Lincoln, Teddy Roosevelt. Well, you missed a few guys in there. I, here I did. There, okay. I did. I'm not going to listen to Zachary Taylor's uh, <laughs> biography, no matter what you say. Anyway. Like I had a fantastic life. Come on. That's right. But the other thing is uh, I kind of realized in a weird way, and maybe this is just my – my mind frame frame of mind now, and maybe this is why I'm so in love with what Marvel's doing is you could almost read these as the president of the United States connected universe, which is you start reading, uh, you know, I was starting to read or listen to uh, Ron it's, Chernow's it's not, it's Washington. Smith, Smith, it's not a connected no, universe. It's, it's, it's history. No, it's I understand. History, I understand. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but what I'm saying, right, just what I'm saying continue. is, continue is I was starting to listen to Ron Chernow's Washington, and then they would talk about, oh, uh, and and here's John Adams and talking shit about um, uh, Washington and how he thought he was kind of adult and kind of a dullard and made fun of him behind his back. And I was thinking, wow, and I'm going to be listening to that. That's going to be the next book. And it almost is this weird, when you listen to them all connected like that, it almost is this weird, hey, Iron Man's in the new Thor movie or whatever, where it's all weaving back and forth and you get to see the scope of the United States begin and change through the lives of these history, you know, of these so men. So really, the after United like States. every five or six book, Maybe you get like a mo- like something where they're all together, kind like of, an yeah, Avengers that's right. style. <laughs> Here's the thing. So I'm going to listen to uh, Washington, then I'm going to listen to John Adams, and then David McCullough wrote 1776, which is about you know the transformational year, which has all of them in it, and it's it's almost like all right, this is where the Avengers assemble and start the United States. Jesus <laughs> Christ, you're a fucking dork. <laughs> I know. I know, seriously. I told you. I told you before. I told you before I started this. This is going to be the dorkiest thing I've ever done. But well, Sonia, so, Sonia's right. It is. It's history, Chris. You have to is, understand. I understand. Yes, that. it fits together because I, that's why history runs. I, I understand that. But but experiencing it in this particular way, almost as kind of like a two hundred fifty year long soap opera of 
you know, men weaving in and out of each other's lives and stuff and what happens in history. It is an interesting way to experience American history. It's surprisingly satisfying, but I am telling you now, and I started this out with, you're going to be so dark. stoked when you get to like the eighties and like Spider-Man is president. No, I am not. Cause, cause it, it, well, the other thing is it's revealing American history, which I already knew as essentially a huge tragedy. <laughs> the, the, it's the got the fact, worst ending ever the fact <laughs> that we're going it's got the most david lynch weird i can't believe i'm seeing this this you from know, where it starts this, it's hard to believe that it ends with like a president who tweets out like stuff about wrestling i know it's it is in Sane. They were, they're talking in Ron Chernow's book, they were talking about how Washington was very uh, worked to be very proper. And he had this this notebook where he would keep all the kind of the rules of Virginian society and all this stuff and how, you, you know, how you're how close you're supposed to stand to people and all this stuff and how you're supposed to fold, you know, fold this and fold that and how you're supposed to wear your shirt which all makes sense, and I understand in that kind of society you would have to go through that. But to think that that kind of care to interpersonal relationships and thinking through how you're going to live your life and what kind of person you're going to be, to to go from that to, well, any one of the last four or five presidents is just mind-boggling. So, so who Good times. Who, who is Trump in the in the universe then, Chris? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, he is. I don't know. He is the. Th that's what I was thinking about. It, it it feels starting starting with the founding fathers and then ending up where we are now. It's almost like we're living in a fever dream, where some you know bizarre demon has literally stepped out of the static of a television to rule the United States. I mean, it's just. Is there a I is there a comic book villain that's basically a like stupid old man who's racist yes is he's, there he's called jefferson davis and he took <laughs> half of the united states with him yes but I luckily said com, i said a comic book villain i was asking well, if there was a well, Trump no, no. comic book villain that, equivalent. that was a comic like, book villain well he literally wanted to enslave Hey, millions of people. So yes, if you want to talk, if you want, you know, you guys are making fun of me, and you should make fun of me. But really, it really, make fun of you. it really is a James Bond level of Machiavellian insanity that he's going to raise an army and attack the United States at the same time that the greatest president in our history happens to be elected, and it's this insane five-year showdown. Actually, the books that I'm going to listen to. That, for the Civil War is Shelby Foote's three volume um, Civil War story. So I am very stoked for that. So make fun of me all you want. I can take it. I, I'm a big boy. I most certainly will. But this is a hell of a fun way to experience American history. President of the United States Extended Universe. You heard it here first. Wow, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm actually, I'm a little scared. I'm a little scared for for history and uh, I'm, for well, history I'm definitely itself. a little afraid for history right now. <laughs> I'm really struggling. I well, don't want to talk about politics anymore. That's right. You All go, right. You go, baby. All right. So Mansfield, is there, Mike, is there anything else you'd like to say before we end the show? No, I'd like to reiterate that you are a major fucking dork. I, I just, I need to say that again. Fine. I'll take or, it. Or, what about me? Or, or no, Sonia, I love you. You're wonderful, Susan. Oh, Sonia, yeah. And, it, <laughs> and again, it really, it really has been a pleasure being on jerking off with you too. And uh, I'll, I'll use that joke again and yeah. again and no. again. Yeah, we'll, we'll have you, you on very quickly so you can use it again. Uh, we might. We, you know what? I think next week we're going to bring you back on. We're going to make you watch Michael Bay's Transformers Five. Nice. That's what we're going to do. I, no. can, I, can I watch it in the original Chinese? <laughs> <laughs> where, where it's going to make all this money? Okay. I'm going to watch it in Mandarin. Oh, that's the world we <laughs> because it, Because it'll probably be better in Mandarin. It probably will. I, Actually, I don't speak a word of it. It'll probably be great. That's right. That's right. Sonia Mansfield, is there anything else you would like to say? No, I'll just say <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> 
Bye! <laughs>